The second point of the four-point programme is coping with urges. So let's listen to a 15-minute lecture by Dr Joe Gerstein, the first president and current board member of Smart Recovery. There are a variety of ways of coping with an urge. The, there is a distinction probably about thinking about drinking or thinking about using and the actual urge to use. And uh, we found that distinction helpful at a meeting. Uh, because a, a thought is something you cannot prevent from coming into your head. Uh, if I tell you, don't think about blue elephants, first thing, you, obviously, you cannot not think about blue elephant. First thing that has to appear is the image of a blue elephant the minute that I say it. And you can't not think about drinking because the thought may come into your head, uh, drugging, the thought may come into your head. Um, but uh, the first thing to be aware is this is just a thought. You don't have to be guilty about it. You don't have to uh, uh, run to a meeting immediately when you get a thought. It's just a thought. Um, but it's up to you what you do with the thought, whether you uh, work with it, whether you, uh, you analyze it rationally and thereby get it to subside, or whether you begin working on it to crank it up into an urge, which is quite possible. So the first thing to do is distinguish between a thought and an urge and work on the thought. And the second thing to do is try to think, why did I get this thought? It, it's not a random occurrence. It's not what I call a, the slam bam alagazam out of an orange colored sky school of uh, of addiction. That is that you're walking down the street and blam, suddenly uh, you have this thought or you have this urge and you have nothing to do with it. Now, um, to give you an example, um, a man uh, came to a meeting and uh, said that uh, his last relapse occurred when he was walking on the beach and he passed a package store and then he had this uncontrollable urge to go in and he went in and he bought a bottle and he got drunk and he relapsed. And I said, well, why, why did you go into the package store? He said, well, I don't know. I just had the urge to do it. I said, well, what were you doing walking on the beach? He said, well, I walk on the beach every day. I said, well, do you pass the package store every day? He said, yes. So why, how, many, how long have you been walking on the beach? He said, two months. So the question comes, which never came into his head, of why that particular day he went into the package store. And, and this is only one of a hundred stories like this that I've heard in my years of smart recovery. So I said, well, well, you know, did anything unusual happen that day or the day before? He said, yes. I've been uh, walking on the beach because I'm doing physical therapy because I hurt my shoulder and they said that if I really did this intense and painful course of physical therapy for two months, I might be able to avoid surgery. I said, well, well what happened? He said, well, the surgeon told me that he's sorry to disappoint me, but despite the fact of all the agony I went through, I have to have the operation anyway. Now, now, here's somebody with an absolutely drastic, you know, dramatic life experience, which almost unequivocally led to this urge to, to get drunk, the disappointment, the, 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 all of the uh, feelings of, uh, of uh, uh, in, inappropriate, the world's inappropriate response to his sacrifice and so forth, drove this uh, urge. And yet he's completely oblivious to it completely oblivious to the sequence of events that was driving the urge. Now, people can't always discover it, but usually they will, and sometimes they don't at that meeting. They think about it for a week. They come back and say, you know, now I know what happened. Now I remember exactly what happened, why I got that urge. So it's always useful to be thinking about why. Why did I get it? Now, um, uh, I run a prison group and I asked uh, someone from one of our groups to cover me for that group. And uh, he's a lawyer, and he wouldn't have to go through all the rigmarole about getting, uh, getting photographed and all of that. And he said, well, I'd like to come a week early because uh, I'll go through with you. I know it's a complicated process getting in and out of a prison. And if I run through it once with you and I meet the people, then it'll be easier for me. 
So he came and he listened to this meeting that was going on and um, uh, something came up in the meeting and the inmates were, they were very um, uh, skeptical about this issue of relating emotional distress to uh, an urge or to a relapse. And indeed, it's not a 100% thing, but it's about a 90% thing in my experience. About 10% of people just want to get high. They don't feel any particular discomfort or, or life, uh, 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 life frustration or something like that. But the great majority of relapses, once it's clear that someone has a significant problem, can be directly related to some emotional distress. And if you don't understand that, if you don't see that link, you're just going to be doomed to repeat it. Just like George Santayana said, those who do not understand the past are doomed to repeat it. And that's exactly the same with, uh, with an addiction. So he, he stopped and told a little story of how one night the phone rang. He was doing very well. He was about two months into smart recovery. He was doing great. He was exhilarated. Uh, and the phone rang, and it was his ex-wife. They had the usual... Uh, you know, pleasant exchange about alimony and child support, all that kind of stuff. I don't know what were the details. And he hung up the phone. He said, ah, the heck with that. Now, 15 minutes later, he's walking through his kitchen, and there's a liquor cabinet there with liquor in it because his wife didn't stop drinking. And he said, I suddenly got the most intense urge. He said, I could taste the booze. He said, I saw that bottle of Jack Daniels come right through the door and was getting bigger and bigger and coming at me. And that's, a, that's an image a lot of people uh, have. And he said, and then I said, why? I've been past this cabinet 200 times since I stopped drinking, and I never got an urge. Why did I get it tonight? And why did he get it? Of course, he was upset about the call with his wife. But notice, that there was no clear link until you think about it. And he said, I suddenly realized that that's what I had been doing for 25 years. That, that uh, uh, response, that uh, behavioral response to an emotional distress had become so automatic. Distress, urge, relief with the booze. It had become so automatic that he wasn't even aware of it. It was truly unconscious. So if it can get suppressed to that degree, it's no surprise that people don't relate it. But it's our job to make that link with them so that they can deal with the issues and not with the urges. The real problem is the issues, the, the problems that we're going to get at in, this, in the third part of this program. Now, I want to also mention in terms of urges about a a sort of a subliminal mantra that runs beneath, uh, it's like a program, a subliminal program, like you go into the supermarket and the Muzak's playing, you know, that's supposed to increase your, your, your purchases. And, uh, and that mantra is the concept that I must be able to drink or drug like everyone else. And if I can't, Life will suck, okay? Now, th this is not commonly spoken at a meeting. It doesn't, it doesn't come out. People don't say this. This is not one of the rational, irrational ideas that we, have, we grapple with. Um, but they're thinking it, because when I mention this, everybody goes, yep, yep. And it's this belief that this is terribly, terribly unfair. I should be able to drink like everyone. He can do it. Is he any better than me? No. And so how do you deal with something like this? Because this is a, a fundamental provocateur of urges as well. And the way that I deal with it is I try to get people to get perspective on it. You know, can you dunk a basketball? No. Okay. Is that something that you're fixated on, you worry about? No. You understand, you're not six foot six, uh, you can't jump four feet off the ground, so you can't dunk a basketball. And you, you, maybe that was important to you when you were 15 years old, but you realized you couldn't do it and you went on. Um, uh, you can't play the piano, maybe. There are a lot of things that we constitutionally just can't do. It's not uh, where you, the way our genes are set up and our growth and development, that's the way it is. And what you can't do is, uh, 
is drink safely without causing a problem. Well, you can't stop at one. Now, uh, the, the, the cognitive way of dealing with these thoughts about drinking, just give you an example. Um, I'll just have one, okay? So these are the entry thoughts into uh, breaking, uh, breaking into a relapse or something like that. I'll just have one, no one will know. Everybody's familiar with this whole scenario, this whole schema. And every single one of these uh, thoughts or ideas s serve one purpose. The purpose is to emphasize the short-term benefits and to avoid, eliminate, subvert, or ignore the long-term consequences. So our job as, a, as an organization and as a coordinator is to try to get people to always link up the long-term consequences with the short-term benefits. Usually, if they do, they won't drink or drug. And uh, so the way, one of the ways to do that is what I call the comma technique. I'll just have one. They like to put a period there. But you and I know there is no period there. This is not a complete sentence. It is not a complete thought. So if you put a comma there and make them finish the sentence, they'll finish it up. They'll say, I'll just have one, or this time will be different, comma. But uh, I know that I can't usually stop at one, or maybe I never stop at one, and therefore I'll have more than one, and therefore I'll end up drunk, and I'll end up in the usual situation that I do. So that, that period, they like to punctuate that and, and, and think that because they do, they can reverse reality or ignore reality, but we all know you can't ignore reality. So uh, these little lead-in phrases that seem so innocent, like, eh, might as well, okay? Uh, again, a complete trivialization of a world-shaking decision. This could be a life-or-death decision for somebody or a marriage-breaking decision. And they're going to decide it as, eh, might as well. I've had people say this, eh, might as well. Six of one, half a dozen the other, not that big a deal. So they convince themselves by using that kind of lingo or, uh, or asking themselves a rhetorical question. Why not? Okay, why not? Now, that's, a, that's not a question. Why not? Okay, they're not going to then go and list why, why they shouldn't do it. <laughs> They're just saying, why not? You know? <laughs> and a, a, a question that answers itself for them. Well, of course not. There's no reason why not, okay? So all these little tricks of the trade are great to bring out, put them on the chart, and then have the group interact. If the person can't figure it out, the group will figure it out. Some of these are unbelievably clever. We don't have time to go into them. Some of them have fooled me for eight years. It took me eight years to figure out what the person was, what the what the irrationality was in the statement that they made.